Night City is where legends go to die. Or so some people say. To be a Night City legend is to teeter on the edge of a knife. Humanity on one side and dreams on the other. But to many, even an attempt at this perilous life is worth it. In Night City, cheap lives pay expensive costs from birth till death. Even if death is all that awaits a legend, that's a small price to pay. For just a taste of power, most never get to glimpse of independence in a world of dependence, of feeling like you're more than just garbage on the street. But Edge Runners makes one thing very clear to us in its first three minutes. No matter how strong you think you are, there is always someone stronger. The story of David Martinez is a story of frustratingly avoidable tragedy. In 10 episodes, you go through the ringer of love and regret and hope and despair. The story is rich and bittersweet. It makes you want to hold the people you love closer. For me, the story of David Martinez is a very important lesson in just treasuring what you have because you could lose everything in an instant. It doesn't matter how good your intentions are, as we see with David. Shit just happens. And some things just sort of feel doomed from the start. Just as David's life was, the moment that he decided to stop living for himself, to not pursue his own dreams, and instead to simply serve as a vehicle for what he perceived as the wants and desires and dreams of others. David starts off as one of six million struggling people in the rough streets of Night City. Though with one saving grace, the love of his mother. Gloria Martinez is overworked, underpaid, and of course at the core of what Gloria wants for her son is just for him to live a happy, healthy life. Gloria has scraped every barrel to get enough funds to send her son to the prestigious Arasaka Academy. But it's very clear that the admission to this school, no matter how expensive, is not a guarantee for David's success. David is an outcast from one of the poorest districts in Night City, Santo Domingo. His corpo peers treat him like a pariah. And it doesn't really matter what David does anyway. He is already a top student, but he's endlessly reminded of his origins and hopeless about where his life will go because of it. A tearful Gloria finally tells David her dream, to see her son rise to the top of Arasaka Tower. All those times he complained about her absence, the late bills, the gripes with the academy, they were all made in ignorance of his mother's selflessness, the result of her deep love for her child. And when she dies, this leaves David alone in the world, knowing that there was no money left to even save her. She prioritized her son before even her own health. To David, it is his fault that his mother is gone. And this moment is where David's fate is truly written, taking on the first of many dreams of others and burdening himself with making them reality. But before David can even mourn his mother, the crushing weight of Night City life bears down upon him. Penniless, destitute, and truly alone for the first time in his life, he recklessly decides to implant himself with the now infamous Sandevistan implant. After taking out his frustrations and riding that high of pummeling his high school bully, David comes back down to earth and realizes that he truly has nothing. Meeting Lucy and Maine's crew is where he finally starts to feel this sense of belonging, something he'd never had in the life that his mother was hoping to build for him. One of the most notable things when David first starts working with the Edge Runners is how he shoves his way through the trauma of his mother's death. David never stops to express it or to fully acknowledge it. To David, Young and naive and only 17, being an edge runner is all he has to even come close to the life his mother wanted him to live. The most damning advice that David receives during this period is when Maine tells him that he can only truly rely on himself in Night City. He encourages him to chrome up like him, 
to try and build himself up to be the best. And David hardly needs any convincing. After feeling powerless in the loss of his mother, blaming himself for not being strong enough or fast enough, he would do anything to not feel that kind of helplessness again. But there is one thing that David never loses, even with Maine's discouragement. His habit of putting himself on the line for the people that he cares about. Lucy is the one ray of light that shines for David. Even if it turns out that she was lying to him during their first meeting, David still realizes that Lucy was being genuine with him. She always hangs on the fringes of the group, almost like she's ready to cut and run at any time. The one other person who does try to interact with her, Pilar, only sexually harasses her. No one really knows her, but David can never shake his first meeting with Lucy. He cannot forget that dream she shared with him. To see someone who gave him hope when he needed it most, now living a sad, lonely life, is unacceptable to David. And so he promises to fulfill Lucy's dream and take her to the moon. But in lasering in on that promise, David disregards what Lucy truly wants. In getting to know David and how good a person he is, Lucy's dream stops being to get to the moon. When it begins to be about the life she wants with the guy who listened while she simply poured out her heart, something she has never been able to have, Lucy tries to tell him that he cannot live his life for other people. But David, unable to move past his need to fulfill the dreams of those he cares about, cannot see what is right there in front of him. As David becomes a part of Maine's crew, the veteran mercenary becomes a father figure. Maine appeals to David through his sheer power. Considering the amount of times Maine saves David, Maine is one of the best examples of just how powerful David could someday be. This appeals to David's fear of being helpless, just as he was when his mother died. Maine even promises to give David his implants in the event of his death, promising him the burdens of Maine himself in an endless quest to redefine the limit of how much one person can handle. You gotta feel for Maine here, because Maine started off life as a kid like David. Now, a far cry from the kid he once was, Maine feels like he's getting to the top of his game. Maine is arrogant. He doesn't realize how dangerously close he is to something that he thinks he is immune to. Cyberpsychosis. And at this point, with David so impressionable, this is rubbing off on him as well. The idea of going cyberpsycho isn't even on Maine's radar. David rejects the idea that he himself will ever find his limit when he is kidnapped by the brain dance author JK. JK mocks David for his tolerance of the torture he's subjecting him to, saying it's only a matter of time before David loses himself to cyberpsychosis. David denies this, certain and swearing that he will never go psycho. After all, if Maine hasn't, why would he? David is only a kid here. Of course he thinks that he can do it. David refuses to see what he doesn't want to see. So when Maine does go cyberpsycho, David is shaken. David tries to mask his insecurities and fears about his own limits by asking if Maine is gonna be okay. It is at these crossroads that David has to make a choice, a choice that even Maine tries to steer him away from. For Maine, at his end, his emptiness compounded by Dorio's death, realizes that David will follow close behind him because of what he has taught him. Maine spends his last lucid words trying to tell David to run and to keep running, or else he's looking at his own future, broken, losing the person he loves, and questioning what this life was even all for, foreshadowing David's own end. And David takes on yet another dream, belonging to someone else he was too weak to save. Again, at his core, he still fears that helplessness. He takes the gun down Maine's implants as they were promised to him and flees with Lucy. Instead of taking Lucy and running away from Night City, as Maine would have wanted, 
David has taken the reins of his old crew, donning Maine's old implants. He is more metal than man, foolishly sold on the idea that he is special. Instead of learning from the mistakes of others, however, David doubles down on his own. JK's words echo back at us, the viewer, but not at David, reminding us that this is how it will inevitably end for our protagonist. Lucy tries her hardest to convince David, more close to danger than he has ever been, to let go of the idea that he has to live for other people. Over the time they've spent together, their relationship has matured, but David still is blind to what the girl he loves is trying to make him see. No matter how many implants or enhancements he has, he is still blind to the hopelessness of the path he is choosing. Even when he starts getting the shakes, hallucinations, and outbursts indicative of cyberpsychosis, he still refuses to admit that he is pushing himself too hard. His fear of helplessness is what is making him more and more helpless. When Lucy calls him on ignoring and minimizing his condition, he tells her that he cannot scale down his augmentation because Maine and his mother left him things to do. David even lashes out at Lucy here, in part because she's hiding what she's doing to protect him from Arasaka. He doesn't really listen to what she wants anyway, so of course she's hiding this because she's scared of what he's gonna do. When Lucy is kidnapped by Faraday and doesn't come home, David doesn't know what to think. Maybe she ran away, maybe even he was too hard on her, but instead of facing how he feels or trying to fix things, he throws himself into the next gig. When Faraday tries to manipulate David into using the cyberskeleton, a part of him still works to convince himself that he can handle this insane augmentation, the ultimate level of cybernetic enhancement, something Maine in his prime would have died to get. But of course David completely declines as soon as he enters this experimental cyberware. Having finally achieved Maine's greatest dream is David's complete and utter death sentence. But at this point, David is still held to some degree of sanity by focusing on rescuing Lucy, who he has learned has been kidnapped by Arasaka. But on the way to Arasaka Tower, David finally admits, in the middle of a psychotic break, the one goal he has clung to, hallucinating his mother in Becca's place. David says the words he never got the chance to say. He promises his mother's memory, like an excited kid, to make her dream come true, to do his best and to work harder. The heaviest burden he has been carrying all along. To David, he has never been enough. David sees the streets of his childhood, those simpler days that he used to hate. There's this flash there of like a question that maybe his life could have been so much different and so much better, but you know, that's only for a second because right after that, he's right back into the battle. Once again, he learns his lesson too late. When David gets to Arasaka Tower, finds Lucy, and fights Adam Smasher, David still tries to say that he's special. David is going through the five stages here. He's going through denial, he's going through anger, bargaining, depression, and then finally acceptance. But it's just a shame that it had to end the way it did. Instead of attacking Adam Smasher and trying to prove his strength, David flees with Lucy in his arms and has one of his last moments of true lucidity. As they kiss in the sky, they are on the moon. This has been Lucy's dream all along, that if she was to go to the moon, it would be with David. But David still does not grasp everything. David admits that he could not resist equipping the cyberskeleton because he could not bear to feel helpless while Lucy was in danger. Not like how he failed to save Maine, his mother, and everyone else in their crew that they have lost. He falls from the sky from that one perfect moment with the one person who lit up his life. He falls, not willing to change the very thinking that got him into this situation. Worst of all, David forces his dream on Lucy. He makes her promise to go to the moon because that was her old dream, the one that he has clung to. David misunderstands her again, despite every single one of Lucy's attempts to tell him that all she wanted was him. 
And it's then that David gets the literal truth beat into him by the most insane, psychotic, sociopathic character in the cyberpunk universe. That he is not special, and never was. That he never truly understood the dreams he tried to live. And that he had his dream in his hands and could have lived a long, happy life with her. And so, at the end, we see Lucy on the moon, fulfilling her final promise to David. But instead of joy, she is once again alone. Because in the end, the moon didn't matter to her. David did. No matter how strong David thought he was, he learned his lesson too late, that someone else was always going to be stronger. 